thank you again for joining uh, the final part of the mini course of Professor Brangoski, 30 minutes. So now uh, let me apply this construction to, to show first the Calderon molecule theorem. So just to recall, the ordinary Calderon molecule theorem, there are many versions of it, but essentially what it says is that if you have a symbol A such that all of its derivatives are bounded, then the operator is continuous in R2. So, technically speaking, if you know the Schwarz space D of infinity on R2n, this means that the function, together with all of its derivatives, are bounded. <coughs> right? So, the classical Calderon Valencourt says that the operator then is a bounded operator from L2 to L2. And uh, the Hormander generalization of for that is a really non-trivial and very deep generalization. If A is in S1G, then the operator is bounded on L2. Uh, of course, you get the ordinary Calderon molecule if you take for G to be the Euclidean metric. Because if G is the Euclidean metric, then this S1G is just the infinity. Just because you, you, you always you, you know by the Euclidean metric, so you don't do anything, you just know the derivatives and the double bound by the constant function, by one. Uh -huh. And the trick, uh, I, incidentally, the trick is very simple. Heavily relies, it heavily relies on this thing. So first, the, the general idea is the following. First take A to be nice. And uh, let me recall one more thing, that uh, the operator norm of the veil quantization in L2, or in L of L2, so this means the bounded operators on L2. For A and S, this all, the, the veil quantization is always bounded on L2, because it's bounded from S prime into S. So this thing is bounded by the Fourier site, the L1 norm of the Fourier site, uh, and why that thing is um, true. Mm. Why is that true? Uh, you can do it by kernels. You, if you look at the kernels, then you can deduce it from the kernels. Uh, mm, I want to give a quick argument for that. It's like a convolution and after that you Yeah, probably, but... Mm. Yes. You, you will believe me on this thing, that, that it's easy yes. to check. Because the trick is again to write the kernel. Uh, so the thing is uh, to norm the, the L1 norm of the Fourier side. And the idea is that I can norm the Fourier side of L1 by this kind of a semi -norm. So again, the broad idea is the following that I can norm this thing in this way, by confining it in some GX. 
it doesn't matter which gx, which one. And then I will use this decomposition. So if I have a general A, I will write my general A Now I will use this decomposition because this one I'll multiply with a of x, a of y, sorry. Right? When you multiply with a of y, you get this one. Okay? And so now the trick is that if you take, vaguely speaking, that if I take the vial quantization of a and put an f here and a phi here, not phi, phi is this phi. Let's pick another one. Psi. For example, in S, this will be exactly A times phi of x justifying it by these holds. But the idea is that thing. That because of again, I'm multiplying this thing with A of with A. So you get this representation of A. And then I I take the vial quantization. So essentially what I'm doing is putting the vial quantization inside and then interpreting this as a Bochner integral for example. Right? And then evaluating it at a psi. Okay? And now this is the, the important thing, thing is that now I have if I want if I put L2 norms here to prove that the integral converges, right? To prove that the integral converges in L2, if I put an L2 norms here, the idea is that, that this thing now is uh, is a symbol in S, and I know that the norm in L2 is bounded by a confined norm of this form. And this thing will be uniform. That's the idea. So, okay, so just let me briefly write it again. Not briefly, but a little bit more detail. Uh, so the first thing you do is you estimate the Fourier, the norm of the Fourier side of A in L1. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, on R2N. Yeah. Estimate the Fourier side of this thing, you like it. and uh, I, I thought that I had more time because this is really easy to write it down, the estimates, and I wanted to write them down, but I don't have much time. I have to skip this part. But what you get at the end is that this thing is bounded. This thing is bounded by A, and the trick is here is exactly you go from the confined norm here exactly to the exponent 2n to n plus 1, exactly to that point. And why? Because you have this thing in the denominator and you want to the integral to converge. And for the integral to converge, you need exactly n plus something. To converge. And this is confined norm, so in this way confined, like this, with 
GX, UX. And the trick is, it doesn't matter which X. And the constant that appears here is uniform. So for A in S, I really wanted to, to write more about this, but I'm sorry, I don't have time because I have to finish. And now, because of this thing, this apply, implies, let me now write here on the General, a general A, I'm going to do this thing. So for a general A, first, I, I, I write my A like this. And then, so first I write my A like this. This holds because this is the composition of identity. Just multiply this identity with A of Y. And you get this. And now, if you want to be really precise, what you do is you don't put a phi here and put a phi here and take the value quantization. You do the other way around. You consider this thing. This is how you do it. And then you show that this converges. And because this converges, this means that if I take the norms from here, the integral exists as a Bohr integral with values in the space of unif of in the space of bounded operators on L2. Right? Because this is the exactly the definition of the Bohr integral. Nice. Right? I think a function is Bohr integrable if it is measurable. And here everything is measurable with this because this phi of x is smooth. If it is measurable and if the norm of it in the space, and now my space is L of L2, uh, the integral of that thing is bounded. So this will mean that this integral will converge, and then you just check it. Check it by applying phi on both sides. The, this operator applied when applied phi, and to this thing, you, when you apply phi, you get the same thing. And now, for this thing, now you use your confinement estimates. Now you have a phi of x and now you, you plug it. You plug it here and you calculate the norms. And here the thing is that a is bounded by 1 because when you calculate this norms uh, maybe I have time to, to, to really quickly calculate this norm, this confinement norm for this thing. So the norm when you take derivatives, because I want to take the, the k derivative and then uh, evaluate the vectors t1 to tk, but this is the same thing as taking the direction of derivatives. These are with respect to y, to the dummy value. Right? So this thing is the same as taking the k derivative and then evaluating it at the vectors. When you take this thing, you get a, a sum of the a, l, y, and then some of the t's go, go, go there, some of the t's go on the other one. It doesn't matter which ones. Blah, blah, blah. Let's just take the first ones for whatever reason. Of course, they are just a combination. Not L, but K minus L. Then you take the norms. Mm -hmm. 
and now this becomes the interesting thing. The trick now is that, okay, so this thing will pull out because the norm of A is bounded by one, right? Uh, it belongs to S1, it's just one, times the length of the vectors, but not at x, but at y, t, whatever, l, not at, at j, to one half, and here j is one to l. This is from this part. And for this part, you have, with norm with respect to x, here the, 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 the you know it with respect to x, but the thing is, that uh, it doesn't matter because this thing has a port in u of x uh, in this confinement set u, um, I mean, not confinement, this set u of xr, and there, because uh, uh, this thing was the ball where u of x, x minus y was less than r square, and because of the slow variation, it doesn't matter whether I choose the metric at y or the metric at x. It will be just a constant, right? Because that's that's how I chose this this thing. So instead of the norms here with respect to x, I can take with respect to y from this part. So in a sense, I will have all of them from this, and this thing will bring down the metric. I mean, not the metric, but the the thing with the metric here. We'll divide it with this thing. I apologize. To power whatever you like. Uh -huh, not whatever. Exactly one, two n plus one half. Okay? And now, because I want to, to take the norm in this confinement norm. So this means I have to divide this thing with the product of the j axis, right? Because the norm, the confinement norm was defined by dividing by the g axis. And now I want to aha <coughs> I want to, this thing to cancel and I took probably the wrong point. I pick it to get y. So I'll change my mind. I'll switch it to x. Uh, you, you, you see why, why I can do this, right? Because of the support of this thing. It doesn't matter which point I choose it. Because I can choose the, the GYs here to be GXs here, or the GXs here to be GYs here, because this thing has a port in the, this unit ball, U of XR. And that's the point of these confined families of symbols. That because they, they restrict you on this set of U of, U of XR, and there the metric at X and the metric at Y is the same. You see what I mean? Again, so because the, you, you, you are restricting yourself at only at the points in the neighborhood of, of x, and there the metric at x is the same as the metric at every other point because of the slow variation. So it doesn't matter which one I choose. So I'll choose the ones that I have to divide them with here. So this will be the x's, and when I divide here, this will cancel, and the only thing will, that will remain will this be this part. Mm -hmm. So let me plug it from the integral. So you get an integral of 1 over 1 plus g of x sigma of y minus u of xr to the power 2n plus 1 over 2. And now I have a gx here. Right? But again, I will play with the supports again, more or less. So I can change the x to y. Okay? Because this thing has support. So not, not exactly, but in a certain way, I can always change this thing to y. Uh, I, I'm not convincing you. Okay, to convince you. Uh -huh. Okay, let me convince you about this. Let me do it by, with the temperance. The temperance is better. 
This was the temper that could be shown. Right? So if I take the symplectic dual of this temperance condition, then you can put here sigma and sigma. So this means that the determinant with respect to x is the same as the determinant with respect to y. Right? Times this thing here. So I can change this determinant from x to y times a factor of this form. And this factor of this form, if I take this n to be now large enough, will be eaten by this thing down. So instead of taking 2n plus 1, I have to take probably 2n plus 1 plus the n from the temperance condition. You can do it. That, that's, that's, yeah. You have prepared the field, yes. Yeah, so that's the point. The point is that you can always, because of the temperance, you can always eat the unnecessary things. And this, this factor that appears in this family of confined symbols will eat everything. And you get a convergent integral here. Because now I'll change it to, to gy. And the symplectic dual is always bigger than the ordinary metric. And now I can put here only the y, the x. And now you get dy. dy dot dx. And now you change variables to eat the y, the unnecessary y. You have only this. And now you change variables again with the quadratic form to take the integral because this is exactly the determinant. And this is a constant. Not just constant, but it's exactly the, this thing is exactly equal to the integral of 1 over 1 plus z squared to the power, this power. 2n plus 1 over 2, dz, after change of variables. Because we have the quadratic form, and then we have the, the what do you call this, the, 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 the Jacobian. Jacobian. And that's it. And this, will, this proves that this integral is finite, which proves that this thing is always converges in L of L2. And then, aha. Uh -huh, so now I will be very efficient and I'll erase this thing. Mm -hmm. I will erase this thing. So this means that this thing converges in L of L2 and defines a well defined operator. In a certain way. Now, I omit a lot of things here, but yeah, the, 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 that's the, 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 general, the general idea. I, I omit more than I like, but yeah. Um, because it's not exactly that simple. I put a lot of things under the rack there. Yeah. Because I cheated a bit on several places. If, what, if you want to really do it by precisely, you cannot exactly do everything like that. You have to somehow estimate not this thing, but estimate. OK, let's not dwell into it too much. You have to estimate the, the, this operator together with this complex conjugate and then use the Kotler lemma, if you know the Kotler lemma. So it's like a sure test. I, I cheated a bit there. But that's the, the whole idea. The, the, the whole idea was that this family of, of combined symbol, symbols allowed me to restrict my, my symbol on a place where I can change everything because it's, yeah. That's how you do the... Uh, that's how you do the, uh, the, the L2 continuity. The continuity of S is really similar. Uh, you have four minutes. Mm -hmm. I will end now. The continuity on S is really similar. I 
10. Now my A is in any SMG. And again, I will use this decomposition. But now I will look at this operator uh, again a phi of x via quantization acting on a function psi in S. This part here is well defined because this thing is a function in S. So the well quantization is well defined as an action on S function, and you get an X function. The trick is well, why, why this thing converges. What you do is you prove that this two converges in L in L2, and then not just that, but that the derivatives of this thing converge in L2, and the multiply, multi, when you multiply them with arbitrary axes, they also converge in L2. So this means that this is a function in S. That's how you do it. So for, first, let me just briefly describe uh, how to do this thing when m is arbitrary. And this, uh, this is a trick of Bonin and Lerner. Uh, Hormander does it in a different way. The trick of Bonin is the following. Uh, again, this is now uniformly confined. This a of, f, a of phi x is uniform, uniformly confined. But in a sense, it's uniformly confined when you divide it by m of m of x, right? Because previously it was just this; it was uniformly confined, confined not with the m of x because this was only one. Now we have to divide with the m of x to be uniformly confined. So this confinement norms here in g x u of x. Another trick is the following. Uh -huh. So I take my beta, oh, no, not beta, I'll use the same notation as, as in my cheat sheet because otherwise I'll make a mistake. I take gn, uh, uh -huh. sorry, I will change the variables here to be y's because in my cheat sheet they are y's and if I use something else, <coughs> I'll mix up. So it's the same thing. So now this is a function of x, and this is now the y uh, I take g n of x to be this symbol. 1 plus g, it doesn't matter which point, I'll pick 0, uh, x. To the power n, and I'll take the uh, value quantization of this. Notice that this is a symbol in the gamma ordinary Schubin classes, right? This is a Schubin class operator of order two n, because this is just a Euclidean, right? And the trick about the Schubin classes is that they're very good, and uh, every elliptic operator, like this, like, it, like this is elliptic operator there, has a parametrics, uh, which means that there exists a uh, beta n which now belongs to the Schubin class, but with order minus 2n, so it uh, decays with order, it decays with minus n order here, such that uh, gamma n, beta n, vial quantization is equal to the identity plus a smoothing operator, plus something, let me call it r, of W, where this R is in the Schwarz class. This is called a parametrix, and the parametrics always exist for the Schubin classes. And now the trick is that I'll represent my psi, the plug the psi here,
minus psi is equal to beta gamma minus r psi. All right? Just psi is equal to, and I right, I just write it down. So this will be beta n gamma n psi minus Okay, and now the trick is the following, that this beta of n, I choose this n in such a way that it will be big enough to eat the m from here. Because m is temperate, and that means that it grows at most polynomial. So I choose my, beta, my n to be big enough such that this composition, because now uh, this is a composition between an s symbol and an s symbol. This everything here is in s. Right? So you just do the ordinary sharp product in S, which is just an integral. The weird integral that we wrote yesterday. So this thing here is nothing but the sharp product. The sharp product. But the sharp product in S. Everything is in S here. And then, because this is uniformly confined in this thing, when you divide it by, by M of Y, this thing will lower it so that it will be uh, uniformly confined with only one. So in a sense, it will be uh, like, uh, it will behave like S1G function. And that means that you can, when you take the L2 norm of this, it will be bounded. But now you have to take an L2 norm of this function. Right, because it's the operator norm in L2 times the norm in L2 of this. Take L2 norms, and this will be L2 norm of this thing, A phi y sharp beta well L of L2 times gamma and vial psi L2. Plus, here will be a phi y sharp r while in L of L2 times psi in L2. And now, now use my fancy estimates for before. This is bounded by the confined norm of a of phi y sharp beta. Confined norm in what, what was it? I need the, at the point y. Right? That was the from the before estimate. And the trick is that this now is uniformly confined in that family. So this will be just a constant. And here you have the L2 norm of this thing. And again, because this is a confined norm, this will pull out a thing with the metric which will make the integral converging. The same thing here. Here is even better because this thing is in S. Uh, this the whole thing is will be, because this is in S, the whole thing will be in S. It doesn't matter, it's uniformly confined for us. Right? Because we, we, we previously proved that the L2 norm of the value quantization was less than the Fourier site L1, which is less than this confined norm. And this thing makes it to be uniformly confined. And the upshot. Now, yeah, I'm finishing now, right? I have to finish. Uh, I'm finishing in one, uh, one moment. So the upshot is that the integral of the, the thing, la 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 la, whatever it was, is less than a semi norm, not a semi norm, but a norm of gamma n psi L2 plus another norm of psi in L2. And this thing is a semi norm in L2. Uh, not in L2, but semi norm in S. Right? Because this is an operator of order n, which acts on psi in L2. This is a uh, semi norm in, bounded by a semi norm of psi. Semi norm of psi, a semi norm in S. And now, <coughs> we are not finished. We have to do, now you, 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 
you, you do this thing, but you take derivatives and you multiply it with x. And you do the same thing, but the trick is that to convince you, the trick is that you get the same thing. Because, uh, because all of these forms, like derivatives and multiplication with, with x's, you get very fancy, write them in this way. You take linear form of this form, And then take the Weyl quantization of this linear form. And the Weyl quantization of this linear form is an ordinary differential uh, operator where you have coefficients and derivatives, but the coefficients are just multiplication by axis. And the trick about this thing is that when you take this composition, this composition is nothing just LT sharp A. And this thing is very easy to write it by the plus one bracket. Use the plus one bracket, and you really elegant. You get very elegant formulas. It's like how you, you switch places. LT goes. The LT will go on this side, and you get the plus one bracket in between, which always lowers the derivatives. And the, it's just a fancy writing of the same thing again. Yes. And that's it. I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. get to the whole point because now I had to talk about the fretfulness. But yeah, Stephen, tomorrow we'll tell you about the fretful operators and yeah, and uh, the results in that. So thank sorry. you. Maybe. So short time. Let's postpone discussions and questions. We have some.